Welcome to Experiments in Leadership. I am Sonu Bhaseen. Experiments in Leadership is a space where industry leaders share their thoughts and stories and anecdotes about various facets of leadership. Before I introduce my guest today, I do want to urge you, as always, to subscribe to my channel. It has great conversations with some really super cool people and it is free to you, so go for it. Today's guest, Niren Chaudhary is the TAS batch of 1986. He worked for a few years at the Taj Group, after which he moved on to the food business. He spent almost 23 years at Yum! and many of them as the global president KFC. KFC is Kentucky Fried Chicken and also as president Yum! India. Yum! India is Pizza Hut. There, among other things. Then a couple of years at Krispy Kreme Donuts as the CEO in the US and the UK. Niren is now the chairman of Panera Brands and he was the former CEO of the company. Panera, Panera Brands, people in India may not be very familiar with it because it is not here yet, but the company has been recognized in the US as one of the top 10 most sustainable companies and one of the top 20 as the most purpose-driven one. Niren lives in the US. But besides all this, you know, Niren is a leader driven by passion, passion for serving others and passion for building future leaders. The passion for serving was very visible during the pandemic. Niren, who was then the CEO at Panera, pledged on behalf of the company to provide five lakh freshly prepared meals to Americans who needed them. He also started a program called Together Without Hunger, where a $3 contribution could provide a freshly prepared meal to someone who needed it. Among all these servings, I must not forget to tell you what is the best serving by Niren, which is music. He's a vocalist. He plays the guitar. You can find his songs on almost all music streaming sites. Niren, what a pleasure and welcome to Experiments in Leadership. Looking forward to my conversation. I know you speak four languages, but I think we'll keep it to English and Hindi besides what Dutch and German. Thank you so much. Great to see you again. Thank you. So, you know, going back to my own TS days, you know, one fact that stood out for me even back then was that it, your focus on motivating others. And now you say at most public forums that you want to build future leaders. So my question to you is, in all your experiences when you're dealing with these, you know, people who want to be future leaders, what are a couple of things that actually prevent people like them from becoming better leaders? Well, um, you know, I really think that leadership is a, is a privilege. Um, and the biggest privilege and honor of being a leader is to able to become a catalyst to unlock the potential that other people have around you. And I have to say that's probably the single most fulfilling aspect uh, of my uh, leadership journey thus far. Okay. And I think um, what I have learned is that the most important job of any leader, as I coach others, is to help them understand that the most important job a leader has to do is to build trust. Trust with all the stakeholders that he or she interacts with. And then, you know, I, I really believe that trust is a function of character and competence. And um, competence, I think we all understand and we, you know, we spend years and years sharpening and honing our competence and our knowledge. And sometimes some of us perhaps don't pay that much attention to building our character. And uh, I've, I have focused a lot on that. I think it's somewhat in a relative sense, I think easier to find highly competent people, yeah. but the true multipliers of impact and result are those who have a strong character and then character in turn as we know is you know about having clarity of who you are what you stand for and holding yourself accountable to that so that is sort of how i approach uh, my coaching with people and as i help unlock their potential is for them to have the clarity of their own values so that they can truly develop their own strength of character as they interact 
with other uh, team members. So you said competence and character. Now, competence is something which can be worked upon in the sense that you can provide training, you can provide knowledge, you can provide whatever, send them to executive management schools, etc. But character, I mean, can that really be changed? And uh, I mean, most people are ready to admit that I don't know this or I don't know that. But I doubt anybody is going to say my character is not good or I need to build on my character. So how, and again, as a leader, when you're building your teams and, you know, the many young leaders who are listening in, how do you identify that character? Sure. So let me explain it by using the metaphor of a tree. Let's say, just visualize a tree. And the leaves of the tree are the outward manifestation of one's behavior. Mm -hmm. People can see that and observe it. Mm -hmm. But what drives the behavior is sort of the trunk of the tree, which are your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And what in turn drives your thoughts, which nobody can see, is not visible, are the roots of the tree, which are your values and beliefs. Mm -hmm. So I feel that what nobody can see, because nobody can see your values, right? Your values and your beliefs are like the roots that define your thought. Your thought defines your behavior. Behavior makes habits. Habits then um, articulates who you are, what your character is, and then character unlocks destiny. Mm -hmm. Going back to building trust, I think a character that inspires trust is one that has a consistent display of behavior that you can always predict how that human being will react. Now, to have consistent behavior, you need to have consistent thoughts and you need to have clarity of values. Yeah. If you have clarity of values, you can hold yourself accountable every single night when you go to bed and say, did I behave according to my values or not? We're all human. We may or may not. If we do not, the important thing is to recognize that, feel bad, hold yourself accountable and wake up the next morning to be a better version of who you are so that you become more and more convergent with what's important to you. Mm -hmm. So that's what I might mean by working on your character to me is working on defining and clarifying what your most important values and beliefs are and then holding yourself accountable to those in every aspect of your life. Yeah. You know, the way that you say it is very deep but I also know that it's not very easy uh, to live by your values, especially in a world which is like ours. Uh, and therefore, it is important for people to realize that if they are looking to go ahead, well, not only in professional life, but also in life per se, uh, character and your values are very important. And I think as in the corporate world, uh, we don't we don't talk about it. It's just seen as, you know, very woman, woman kind. You know, you're talking about the softer values. So I'm glad that, you know, you're focusing on that. Now, you know, when you're talking about a leader's job, uh, besides training, coaching, dealing with adversity is also a part of any leader's job. And you've had, you know, a great deal of adversity, both in personal life and professional life. Now, can a leader actually prepare to deal with adversity or do you, it, it, is it just test by fire? And you know, that's when your character shows up, is it? How, can you actually prepare? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's a great question. And I think being resilient and being tenacious is one of my core values. And mm -hmm. I do believe that I want to define myself as a person who can never be kept down you know mm -hmm. that i will fall i will i will have failures i will make mistakes i will fall down but i will always 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 get up and mm -hmm. i will get up with strength and i will fight the good fight and i will do my very best to be my very best you know and 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 i have realized something about what helps one be resilient yeah. um, because it is such an important attribute. So as you know, I've lost two of my daughters 
over the last many years. I lost my first one when I was just 24. Uh, her name was Tanya and she passed away. And then I lost my second daughter recently, Aisha, passed away in 2015. Yeah. And then I've had many other, you know, professional and personal setbacks like we all do. Yeah. And I've tried to sort of accept it, uh, embrace it and allow it to shape who I am and how I show up. And that one can define as being resilient. But these, there are two ways in which I've tried to learn how to be resilient. The first one, ironically, to be resilient is to, whenever there's adversity, is to first learn to love and forgive your own self. Your own self. So yourself. You start by loving yourself and forgiving yourself for whatever setback you may have had, whatever adversity you may have faced. Like, you know, with my daughters, I always felt very responsible as a father who failed. And I felt, you know, uh, very pained by that. I could not save them. Mm. I blamed myself for it. And and then I think I, I could even not... Even though you're not a doctor. You even still, though I'm not a doctor... You like, still blamed yourself. I said, you know, it is a father's responsibility to look after his children. And uh, just like a mother or a parent's responsibility. And how can I not protect and preserve my child? And how can not I not could not have financial means to have helped my children, you know, so mm. I think this is true of many of us. We take personal accountability for what happens and especially our failures and are very, very hard on ourselves. Mm. So my first realization is if we are so hard on ourselves, we cannot find the strength to move forward. Right. And the only way to move forward is to first accept what happened and forgive oneself and learn how to love yourself again. And by that, I mean, Take the time to fulfill our little dreams and mini bucket lists that all of us live with, you know, all the time. And we say one day when I'm older or one day when this happens or I'm, you know, I have money, I will do, I play golf or I play guitar or I'll do this or that or learn languages. I think my realization is that actually there is, we only have the present moment. Mm. We do not have the past that is finished and we have don't have the future because it hasn't arrived. Mm -hmm. And the present moment is all that we have and therefore we must embrace it and live life to the fullest. So whatever our dreams we may have, we must fulfill it. Mm -hmm. So for example, when I lost my daughter, <laughs> you'll probably laugh at this. I took a sabbatical and I said, I'm going to like do what I want to do. I'm going to show myself that I love myself. Mm -hmm. So the first thing on my list was to go to Harvard. Right. And I, went, I went to Harvard like a classic nerd uh -huh. and, I went and did an advanced management program, you know, there. Second thing on my dream was I want to record my own songs. So I hired a studio and recorded my songs. Third was I want to teach. So I you know, went to a bunch of colleges and started teaching. Mm -hmm. I did all of that in a short span of four to five months. Mm -hmm. And I found I could, you know, if I did that and if I acknowledged my needs and what I wanted, and loved myself, I could actually still smile and I could be happy and I could move forward. So that is one important condition to love yourself. The second is that we, we all leverage the position that we have to serve others. Right. And that's where my desire and compassion and sense of empathy and commitment comes to serve communities, mm -hmm. uh, to help unlock the dreams of people who work with me or to serve the planet. And I have been very fortunate to work in companies where my co-workers and teams have similar aspirations. And we have therefore been able to convert my pain into purpose for the organization and serve other people. And I feel, you know, as human beings, we are so, uh, I think we are so orientated towards service that it is deeply, deeply fulfilling. So I would say in summary, resilience for me is self-love and service of other people yeah. that helps one keep moving forward. Yeah. Great uh, thoughts for uh, uh, life and leadership. Now, you know, staying on the topic of leadership, I read in one of the interviews that you said that when there's a storm raging outside, I don't want to sit inside. I want to go out and build a windmill to harness the energy of the storm. Now, at one level, while it may sound bizarre, but you know, when you think about it, it's also sounding very logical, but very tough. So 
as a leader, why is it important for you to go right into the storm? And how do you get others to follow you there who may be cowering behind and saying, nay, nay, you know, we don't want to go out. Well, you know, it's a re re resilience we talked about. That's one of my core values. The other core value is courage. Mm -hmm. and courage I define as, you know, focusing on what you can do mm -hmm. and not what's happening to you. Mm -hmm. And it's such a such an important value because I think if you do that, even in the midst of a storm or difficulty or uncertainty or all the series of external shocks that we have endured uh, as, as a human race, whether it's the pandemic, the Omicron, um, COVID, inflation, supply chain issues, etc., all of that that's been happening. There's nothing we can do about these macroeconomic events, but within our own piece of enterprise or community um, or circle of friends uh, or people that we love, there is always something that we can do. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I would argue always, always, always. Yeah. And therefore, if you remind yourself and the enterprise that, okay, let's be a windmill, let's harness the fury of the storm and convert it into something positive. Basically, that means is let's stand tall mm -hmm. and let's see this as an opportunity. And let's like focus on how could this actually be a good thing for us? How can this be a catalyst for us to become even stronger, even better? And, you know, it appeals to the innate nature of human beings, because I think as human beings, we all desire to have courage and to move ahead. Mm. And we get inspired by that. So I think if, if you clarify that and remind everybody, hey, listen, we can't help what's happening around us. Let's just focus on what we can control. I think it basically becomes a real a force that gathers the organization together, converges them and helps them become a lot more inventive, a lot more resilient in the face of external difficulties. So if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that as a leader, you have to believe in your own inner strength, courage, resilience, go out there, be the example. And there will be people who will follow you because that is a characteristic that is inside us. And sometimes maybe we just need someone who's out there as an example for all of us to follow. So as a leader, one should not be afraid of doing something that nobody else has done before, uh, because there are people who will be ready to follow you. Yeah. Good yeah. Advice. I think as, as long as it is authentic and which is I why I think, it's authentic, Absolutely. which, which yeah. is why I talked about the importance of values. So if, if courage and resilience are my values, yeah. I hold myself accountable every single day in every conversation, every time I show up, yeah. then people believe that that is the authentic me and therefore then they respond because they understand, yeah, this is a deep commitment. This is how he shows up consistently and yeah. therefore I believe it and I think we should follow. Yeah. No, that is absolutely true. And, you know, authenticity uh, is visible as is whatever is the opposite of authenticity. And you can't fool people. I mean, if as a person, I can make out that somebody is not being authentic, if I am not being authentic, I can't assume that, you know, everybody else is an idiot and they won't find out that I'm not being authentic. So yes, authenticity is key and it takes time to build trust. But uh, once it does, you have a team that can create magic. And, you know, I've, I'm, 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 I'm a great believer of that. But Niren, you know, this podcast is really about experiments in leadership and to two parts to that, an experiment that worked for you and an experiment in leadership that did not. So which one do you want to talk about first? Yeah, when you asked me that, you know, that question and I was very intrigued by it. And um, I, um, I wondered if I should share a very um, broader insight around, um, you know, since we talked about coaching and developing yeah. as to how, what this meant to me when, when I thought about your question. And it, it led me to think about, you know, ex experiments in leadership that work or don't work and how does that shape you as a leader? Yeah. And one of the things that I think I wanted to share with all your listeners is the, our personal development journey. Now, you know, 
in most organizations, our personal development journey is built primarily on amplifying our strengths and then addressing our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And mostly on addressing our weaknesses, you know, and, and people want to work on that and send you out for uh, seminars and, and, you know, coaching. They want to send you out to Harvard. Or, or, yeah, or in my case, go to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I've, I've, I've realized that having coached so many incredibly talented people that it's very hard to overcome weaknesses. Mm. And I have come to believe that one should, that one's, as when you're a coach, one's endeavor should be to amplify your strengths disproportionately. Right. And actually make you aware of the flip side of your strengths. Mm -hmm. Not so much your weakness, but your strengths itself has a mirror image, mm -hmm. which under certain circumstances, can be a derailer mm -hmm. and being aware of both sides of what makes you who you are mm -hmm. is perhaps a very powerful way to coach people. Mm -hmm. So if you like this line of thinking, I can elaborate with some examples. Yeah, so just give an example about, you know, a strength that has a flip side. So for example, I'll talk about my own um, strengths and, and how that is actually uh, a problem. And I've experienced it to be actually something that doesn't always work, you know, to your question around experiments and leadership. Yeah. So I have my one of my core strengths is uh, people. Mm -hmm. uh, I love people. I believe in the intrinsic goodness of people. Mm -hmm. And I always believe in people. Mm -hmm. So that's a nice, you know, strength to have. But you can easily imagine that if if it's taken too far, as a leader, I can be blindsided to what's happening. I can start believing things that may not be true because I always listen to people and believe in their positive intent. Right. And as a leader, I may become disconnected with the reality of the organization. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I have to say, well, do I stop believing in people? No, I'll hold on to my strength, but I'll then create an intervention knowing that this could have a, you know, a negative side to it by cultivating a team of truth tellers in the organization, all the way across the organization. And I engage them and tell them, hey, I really respect you. I know you give it to me straight. Can I enroll you as a truth teller? teller? So I will periodically ask you and you give me the no bullshit, you know, straight version of what's happening. So that's right. one example. Another example is, you know, I, I love learning. I'm very curious. I, I love to read. And my mind is always sort of, you know, thinking about new ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Now, whilst that is very good, you can imagine in an organization, it can drive the organization crazy because I may not stick to a set set uh, set of priorities or be very focused in what needs to be done because mm -hmm. I get bored and I want to learn and I want to do this, I want to do that. And the organization goes but bonkers. That's where the truth tellers come in useful. They'll say, boss, enough, <laughs> settle down. Yeah. So here the intervention that I came up with was knowing that this is a problem with me that I pick up my uh, learning and curiosity in one discipline at a time, that's a business issue. Mm -hmm. So if the business is dealing with wanting to become much better on, on our digital e-commerce journey, mm -hmm. I'll just pick up that one subject and go really deep as opposed to, you know, 20 different things mm -hmm. and drive the organization crazy. Mm -hmm. so, so those are two examples of, I don't want to become less curious. That's who I am. I don't want to not believe in people. That's who I am. But I must recognize that these things are not all good. You know, mm. they, they do have a shadow side. Mm. And therefore, I must have interventions and be aware of it mm. uh, as I grow and, and you know, lead myself mm. and others. Now, so is that something? So you've talked about something that worked for you. Uh, any story, any, any anecdote, yeah. any stuff that did not? Yeah, you know, so many, so many stories. Uh, uh, I think one like really funny story is, um, is on this topic of, you know, um, of working in different cultures. How mm. do you work in different cultures? So I've, you know, as you mentioned, I've worked in India, obviously, I understand the culture here, but I've worked in the UK. Mm. Um, I worked in Holland uh, mm. for five, six years. I worked in Germany for a bunch of time. 
Mm. And then I worked in, you know, across the, uh, across many markets in my international roles. Mm. But uh, the story is that I, I went back to, uh, when I started my job in Netherlands as the general manager, mm. um, and I was just getting to understand the culture. I learned the hard way because I've always been a believer that when you, when as a leader, you go into a new culture, it is your responsibility as a leader to adapt, yeah, yeah. to be sensitive, to adapt, to learn the stylistic differences of different cultures. I, I deeply believe that people are more similar than dissimilar. If you get behind the external differences, whether you're a Dutch guy or German, you know, deep, deep inside, all of us want the same things. We want love, respect, recognition, purpose and care. Yeah. You know, but there are important differences behaviorally and you have to be uh, aware of that, yeah. So in, in, in Holland, you know, I, I said, well, I must be respectful. I must understand. And I realized that Holland um, and the Netherlands is a very egalitarian society mm -hmm. and you have to lead by consensus, mm -hmm. So which means that irrespective of what level the person is in your company, you have to ask everybody their opinion, at least that was my experience. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Okay, this is the consensus. Off we go. If you do that, people are, you know, behind you, they're committed and they'll, you know, they'll do anything for you. Yeah. So I went to Germany, which is across the border. And I, I was looking after both markets. And uh, the Dutch are also, you know, very spontaneous, much like us in India. Right. So they would, if I was driving on the motorway and I had a long uh, you know, drive, I would just randomly call up some people and have a chat, mm. you know, a chit chat and this and that and how are things and people would enjoy that. And I'd love that aspect about mm. Netherlands. So they were, they wanted to be involved and they were very spontaneous in their relationships. I go to Germany mm. and I'm applying the same, I thought it's like a German culture, you know, very similar to Holland. Mm. So I turn up and uh, I ask people in Germany, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And I got blank stares. Uh -huh. And then I got some strong feedback and they said, you know, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you come across as such a weak leader who doesn't, doesn't know what he wants to do. It's your, I mean, for heaven's sake, you're the leader. You should be telling us what to do. Why are you asking us? You know, mm -hmm. and we are, we are happy to sort of, you know, contribute to that, but you need to provide the di direction. I said, mm -hmm. okay, I understand. <laughs> and then I would be driving on the autobahn from Holland to Germany, from my Amsterdam office to Dusseldorf. And I just dial up some of my German friends for a chat mm. and they would sound shocked and they would say, did you have an appointment to talk to me? <laughs> Why are you just calling me? I said, no, I just thought, you know, we'll catch up. He said, listen, you're assuming that I'm sitting here twiddling my thumbs and waiting for yeah. you all. I mean, okay, you're my boss and all that, but you need to respect me and respect my time, you know? Wow. So I think as leaders to what works in one culture, you know, doesn't obviously work stylistically in another culture and yeah. just just having fun with that and having a sense of humor and taking in chin and, you know, learning from it and adapting so that you're able to lead in different uh, cultures has been phenomenal. I really, really enjoyed that and, and you know, had some good laughs around uh, yeah. How insensitive I've somehow ended up being. You may end up being seen. Okay, so before we end, just one question stemming from the various countries that you have worked in. And also, you know, you've also interacted with a lot of leaders, political and sports leaders, entertainment leaders, and I don't know, maybe chefs, some of your diva chefs who also have a huge egos. Now, what is, you've also met Trump, you were part of that round table. Uh, what are some of the quirky stuff that you may have picked up from these leaders across? I think um, I, you're, you're right. I mean, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of meeting some outstanding people uh, through my career and life and continue to do so. And, and I really get inspired by all sorts of people. You know, it's, there's always something you can learn from other people that they're really good at and how they show up. And, um, I think what I really like, what I, what really appeals to me is, is when people are uh, very authentic and very consistent in who they are, you know, and very confident in who they are. Mm -hmm. That is always very endearing and, and, um, and that they show up in the same authentic way and they don't really care about, you know, how you're coming across or, you know, mm -hmm. what people think of you. Like, like, you know, like they say that we spend most of our life 
wondering what people are thinking about you and then realize that nobody thought about you in the first place. Right, right, right. And, and, and you know, that's the same thing with me. It's only recently I realized that nobody, nobody actually thought about me. <laughs> thought about me. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, so I like people who are very sort of self-assured, self-confident and believe in who they are and show up in that, in that way. Mm -hmm. And then I think what I found is that um, people who are able to achieve uh, disproportionate success Mm. are always lifelong learners mm. and they're constantly looking to learn from anybody uh, mm. no matter who you are mm. uh, you know every time you interact mm. they have this ability to ask some fantastic questions mm. Mm. Um, and therefore use those opportunities to just learn just pick one thing from people that you admire and then you know you keep sort of improving so you i think this mindset of being a lifelong learner is a powerful one Hmm. Good. It's fantastic. Uh, I mean, we can go on and on, but I know that you're on holiday and thank you for taking time out of your holiday to do this podcast. So, um, I mean, thank you, Niren, for your time. And viewers, we'll keep having more conversations. So keep watching this space. Till then, ta-ta.